Society's second annual Fred Evans Different. Memorial Lecture. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about Fred Evans because Ryan, our speaker for tonight, will uh, will will talk to you about him. But I'm delighted to welcome you here, especially people from Canterbury Rugby League. Uh, thanks to Wayne for circulating that email for us. Uh, and it's a real pleasure for me because this evening unites my the three passions of my life, really, which are in no particular order: history. Socialism and Rugby League. <laughs> uh, rugby League, I've been a spectator, a player, a coach, a manager and an administrator for just about my entire life, ever since I was a kid. Uh, and so it's really good to be able to uh, come to a talk on Rugby League here in New Zealand. Um, a historian of Rugby League in, in, in the UK, which as you can tell that's where I'm from, said there are two sorts of history. There's the history of kings and queens and empires and states and churches. And then there's the history of dissent and subversion of people who stood up and said no. And of people who followed and played rugby league, he said, we're not quite respectable. There's a hint of the outlaw and renegade about us. Uh, and I think that's going to be part of the theme of, uh, of Ryan's talk this evening because rugby league was born out of class struggle and it became very much a working class sport in the north of England, here in New Zealand and in Australia. Uh, but I'll leave Ryan to, to develop that, that theme a little more. I just want to talk a little bit about things from experiences that I've had in the game. Um, because rugby league in the UK and elsewhere became a real threat to rugby union in the late 19th century and the early decades of the 20th century. And the whole question of professionalism and whether you should be play, paid to play sport became a real issue. And when it became apparent to the rugby union that by stopping people from being paid, they were going to lose clubs, for example, in the UK, the whole of Cumberland Rugby Union switched to rugby league at a stroke, they started to turn a blind eye to payments in countries like Wales and France and Italy and Romania. Blatant hypocrisy, basically, because they knew that if they stopped those countries paying their players, even just to take time off work, they were going to lose them. The outstanding example of that, of course, is France. In rugby league terms, France was, uh, French rugby league was established in 1933, and it was always associated with radicalism. And there's a lovely report about the Narbonne Club in 1936 winning the championship, and the players en masse singing the Internationale to celebrate their win. The rugby union was seriously worried in France, and the Vichy regime, the collaborators with the Nazis, took the opportunity, there were several high up rugby union officials in the Vichy regime, to get the game banned. They seized their grounds, they seized their assets, and destroyed the game in France for the whole of the Second World War and the succeeding period. If you look at the minutes of the rugby union in England over any time from 1900 through to the 1670s, they're dominated by rugby league. They were scared stiff of the sport. And as a result, there was rampant discrimination. And I'm only talking about England now, and I'm sure here in New Zealand and people in Australia can cite loads and loads of similar examples. So, rugby league was not allowed to be played in the armed forces until the 1990s. It was not allowed to be played in universities to, until the late 1960s. I was never allowed to play rugby league at school. Rugby union players were banned for life from even talk, for even talking to a rugby league official. One guy went north had a chat, didn't even play a trial game, went back down to Wales and found that he'd been banned for life. An 18-year-old schoolboy was banned for life for playing rugby league outside school. And yet, if you played professional football or professional cricket or professional hockey, that was fine. That was okay. No problem with that. Yet, lots and lots of Welsh players did go north in spite of the fact that they were getting paid under the counter in Wales, especially black Welsh players. No black player played for Wales at Rugby Union until the 1980s. It was well known that if you were a black player, you would not get selected for Wales. In England, there was one black player in 1908, who then switched to Rugby League and was banned for life. There was not another black player until the 1980s. So it was discrimination at all levels. And yet, Rugby League has a proud history in, the, in England, certainly, of racial equality. It had the first black person to coach a professional sports team, a guy called Roy Francis. It had the first black player to captain any British national team, a guy called Clive Sullivan. Clubs welcomed black players from South Africa 
where they were not allowed to be selected for the South African Rugby Union team, so they came across to England to play a rugby league. <coughs> now, you might think that all that changed when Rugby Union went professional, and suddenly, and people have said it to me, particularly from Rugby Union, oh, well, everything's different now, we're both professional, there's no problem. For the last 20 years, I've been a development officer for the RFL and for the European Federation. I've been a development officer in Africa, Eastern Europe, all over the place. And believe you me, these things have not changed one iota. They're just slightly more underhand about the way in which they do it. So, for example, World Rugby, as the Rugby Union is now known, has consistently blocked Rugby League membership of the Global Association of International Sports Federations. Now, you might say, so what? Well, for new countries that I work in, countries like Serbia, the Ukraine, or Jamaica, Ghana, that membership will get you access to government funding. And without it, you can't get that. Yet, full members of the Global Association include such wonderful sports as arm wrestling, cheerleading, sumo wrestling, chess, and mind sports. But Rugby League is not even allowed to be an observer, sorry, an associate member. It is in the third rank. It's an observer. Because Rugby Union consistently blocks it. Discrimination still goes on in all the countries I've worked in. Rugby will go to a, gov uh, to a government and say there is only one sort of rugby. These guys trying to establish Rugby League are imposters. And because the government knows no better, they accept that. Okay, and they say, well, we can't have two, two governing bodies, so... You're not allowed. You are. Where that doesn't work, they'll use money and bribery and outright corruption in order to ban rugby league. And I've come across this over and over and over again. I was saying to Ryan earlier on, I could write a book just about the experience of the discrimination I've had, uh, both personally uh, and, and in terms of the game. In 2015, a guy called Sol Mokdad was put in jail in Dubai for trying to establish a rugby league team in the United Arab Emirates, at the behest of the Rugby Union. In Georgia, in 2000, Georgia beat Russia in Tbilisi in front of 10,000 people. They had a civic parade through town with the president welcoming them. Two weeks later, the Rugby Union offered every one of those players a job and a car, and Rugby League in Georgia was wiped out at a stretch. And funnily enough, the Georgians come half went on to play for France at Rugby Union. Um, and I could go on and on. So. My point really is, it was born out of class, stru class struggle, it is a working class sport, and that struggle is still there today all over the world. It hasn't changed, it hasn't altered. Um, and on that note, I'll finish by saying we are still outlaws, so welcome fellow outlaws, and uh, I'll hand you over to Ryan for tonight's talk. Ryan, um, as those who looked at his Facebook page will know, is looking at, at, uh, at Rugby League and New Zealand history from social and cultural perspectives. Uh, in earlier days, he wrote a, a, an undergraduate dissertation on the Passive Resisters Union, which was a group of young lads who opposed militarism pre-First World War. And then he did a master's thesis on the history of trade unions post-Second World War. So he's got a, a history, if you like, of looking at working class movements in New Zealand and now at Rugby League. So, Ryan, uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming along to the Freddy Lynn Memorial Lecture this evening, and thank you to Tom Rude, Martin Tripp, and the Canterbury Socialist Society for inviting me along.
It's a great thrill to be invited to speak at this event, as I live just up the road from Freddie Lynn's final resting place at Waikaraka Park, and I visit him there often. And to get the chance to speak about Rugby League at this memorial lecture seems fitting. Now, I don't know if Fred ever played the game, but the town where he was killed, why he, was one of dozens of places around the country that was swept up in what John A. Lee later described as the evangelical fervor for rugby league that existed in New Zealand between 1911 and 1913. The game had established a domestic presence in New Zealand three years earlier, following the return of rugby league's pioneering international touring team, Your Gold, from Australia in June 1908. But in the face of spirited opposition from the New Zealand Rugby Union, Rugby League struggled to make much headway outside of Auckland. But this all changed in the years just before World War I, when Rugby League developed into a code that was played all over the country. As documented by the New Zealand Rugby League historian Bill Greenwood, new rugby leagues were established in the Waikato, King Country, Hamilton, Golden Bay, Whanganui, Hawke's Bay and Danny Burke in 1911, in Thames, the Goldfields, which included Waihi, Wellington, Marlborough, and here in Christchurch in 1912, and in Gisborne in 1913. And according to Dr. Greenwood, the people who embraced the game during its national consolidation were overwhelmingly drawn from amongst working class communities. From his analysis of player names alongside the employment detail available on the electoral roll, Greenwood explained that the occupational spread of rugby league players indicates that the sport appealed primarily to workers, particularly the unskilled, while the game was largely shunned by middle-class footballers. And this theme is also evident in the game's administrative rank, where in contrast to rugby union, working men were well represented on the governing bodies of early 20th century um, rugby league. And the fact that rugby league consolidated its place across the country's sporting landscape between 1911 and 1913, and that the game had a clear working class bias at this time, is significant. Because in tandem with rugby league's growing popularity in New Zealand during those years, the years between 1911 and 1913 were characterized by the most significant working class upheaval in this country's history. Across those three years, thousands of ordinary people became part of an industrial movement that developed into a genuine threat the economic and political establishment of early 20th century New Zealand. Speaking to this moment in his history of revolutionary industrial unionism in early 20th century New Zealand, Eric Olsen described the three-year period in the following terms. In 1911 to 1913, industrial militancy became a mass movement in New Zealand. Men and even women, previously divided and apathetic, suddenly gained a sense of their power and their dignity. They began to know themselves as important people, doing important work, and learned that they could be the cutting edge of historical change, heirs to the world and its wealth. Their traditional sufferings, low and irregular wages, poor housing, high unemployment, high risks of injury and even death, which had once pressed them down towards destitution and apathy, now fired their rage and gave focus to their vision. It was for this movement that Fred Evans was martyred in 1912 when he was bludgeoned to death in Waihee on Tuesday the 12th of November. And it was at this moment, when New Zealand was closer to open class warfare than at any time before or since, that rugby league's administrators overcame the opposition of the NZRU to establish their game as a sport played all over New Zealand. And this timing is not a coincidence, because the broader class tension that permeated New Zealand society in the years immediately preceding World War I served to cast the class tensions inherent in the issue of player payment in sport into sharp focus in the local context. When rugby split in two in England in 1895, the issue at the heart of the divide was social class. The game of rugby was developed in England across the early 19th century, or 1800s, where, as the sport's name indicates, it was initially associated with prestigious schools and universities. Amongst the game's traditional constituency, the sport's amateur traditions were a central component of a broader ethos that emphasized notions of self-restraint, fair play, and teamwork, and saw the game of rugby 
come to be held up as an important tool in the moral training of young middle class men. During the second half of the 19th century, the gains appeal expanded beyond this traditional constituency, and by the late 1870s, rugby enjoyed a strong following in some of England's northern industrial centres, where the game developed a close association with many working class communities. The game's traditional constituency, however, viewed this growth in rugby's popularity with concern, as they saw a growing influence of working class people and attitudes in what they viewed to be their sport. An article from the Yorkshire Post in the 1880s captured some aspects of this perspective. Public school men do not care to be hooted and yelled at as part and parcel of a sixpenny show. They do not care to meet and associate with men who care nothing for the game other than as a means to an end. And so in 1886, the Rugby Football Union, or the RFU, codified the amateur ethos of rugby's traditional constituency into the rules of the game. In doing so, the RFU imposed genteel assumptions around the purpose and meaning of sport upon everyone who played the game, and as a result, the move exposed the deep class divisions of Victorian era England in the game of rugby. In response to the codification of the amateur ethos, several northern clubs began to argue for the right to make what they referred to as broken time payments, which were payments that sought to compensate footballers for wages lost as a result of time taken off work to play football. And in arguing for the right to make these payments, the arguments were often framed in overt class terms. Rugby is no longer the pastime of the public schools and the leisured classes alone, explained the secretary of the Yorkshire Rugby Union, James Miller, in 1891. It has become the sport of the masses, of the wage earning classes in our great manufacturing centres. It is unreasonable to expect the same amateurism from the wage earning classes as from public school men. It is unfair to expect working men to break time to play football without their being remunerated. These arguments largely fell on deaf ears amongst rugby's late 19th century administrators, the majority of whom were unwilling to accept anything short of pristine amateurism. Commenting on the stance as tensions in English rugby increased during the early 1890s, an article in the Yorkshire Owl newspaper explained that the RFU comprising the universities, the schools, and many clubs formed afterwards by the old school brigade will never stand professionalism in the game, no matter what name it is cloaked under. The RFU would have to sacrifice many fine exponents of the game doubtless, but it would not hesitate. The RFU would lose a good many international games, but it would still not hesitate. And so, with the amateur ethos holding considerable cultural significance in a middle class context, but being patently unfair in a working class context, the divide in English rugby proved irreconcilable, and on 29 August 1895, the game of rugby split in two, when around 20 northern clubs met at the George Hotel in Huddersfield, it's pictured there, and over a beer, <laughs> cheers, <laughs> decided to break away from the RFU. And in splitting off from rugby's governing body, the Northern Clubs agreed to form a Northern Rugby Football Union, pledging themselves to push forward without delay its establishment on the principle of payment for bona fide broken time payments only. And so Rugby League was born in the north of England as a result of the class distinctions exposed within the game of rugby following the codification of the amateur ethos. And as rugby, and the game's amateur traditions developed a presence around the globe as part of the cultural baggage of the British Empire, the same tensions that had led to a split in English rugby in the late 19th century soon rose to the surface elsewhere. Rugby was first championed in New Zealand by early settlers with some connection to Britain's prestigious educational institutions, and in the second half of the 19th century, the game developed a firm foothold across the country when it was embraced by newly established schools that were modelled on England's public school tradition. So Christ College, um, 
Jyoti College, um, Auckland Grammar, Otago Boys High, um, those sorts of schools. But despite these beginnings, by the turn of the 20th century, rugby's New Zealand player base had largely shed its exclusive character, and the sport enjoyed broad support from across the male Pākehā population of the day. In light of the game's broad popularity amongst Pākehā men, aspects of the sport's traditional ethos was modi were modified in New Zealand to better fit local conditions. So, for example, the game was played. The game of rugby was played with a greater emphasis upon victory than rugby's traditional ethos thought proper. And the New Zealand Rugby Union developed its own interpretation of the RFU's amateur regulations, which saw rugby's local governing body provide footballers with a payment of three shillings per day while they were out of their home district on football tours. While viewed as excessive by the RFU, the NZRU's three shillings a day was still a very small sum of money in the early 20th century. So for example, the average unskilled worker's wage at the time was two pound 10 shillings a week, which meant that some of the country's lowest paid workers were received more than twice that allocated to touring footballers. In light of the fact that representative footballers were occasionally asked to be away from their home for months at a time, and that, as already noted, working men were well represented in rugby's early 20th century playing ranks, the NZAU's approach to player payments created tensions within New Zealand rugby. The 1905 original All Blacks are best remembered for establishing the record of on-field excellence that the All Blacks have maintained to this day. But behind the scenes of that tour were significant tensions at the NZRU's approach to player compensation. Reflecting on this issue in the context of rugby league's domestic development in late 1908, the fullback of the 1905 All Blacks, Ernie Booth, argued that it was the NZRU's failure to adequately compensate the original All Blacks that created the conditions for rugby league's local development. I maintain that had the members of the original All Blacks each received remuneration for their loss of time or wages on that tour, which could well have been spared them from the £10,000 profit, the professional New Zealand team would never have been formed. That they, the All Blacks, could scarcely raise £10 in the whole team on their return passage home to New Zealand is well known. And the fact made a great impression in colonial circles. This brought the question bluntly before the public, and it was generally admitted that the team was not properly treated. Several were men of means, and could well afford the loss of time, but the majority were working men. From this, the germ of money making was initiated by the rugby union themselves. When the original All Blacks returned to New Zealand in 1906, they were welcomed home as conquering heroes. With the exception of the Welsh national team, the side defeated all comers on their seven month tour, claiming a record of 830 points scored and just 39 conceded. But in addition to this incredible on-field record, when the original All Blacks got home to New Zealand in March 1906, they also brought word from the north of England that the Northern Union were interested in hosting a team of colonial rugby players. When this news reached a Wellington postal worker and club footballer by the name of Albert Baskerville, he made some discreet inquiries with some of his fellow players, and he discovered that there was significant interest in the idea. And so, after confirming that the Northern Union were interested in hosting a New Zealand side, Baskerville set about organising for a team of top local players to tour England and Australia, playing rugby union under Northern Union rules. Right, sorry, playing rugby under Northern Union rules. And so, rugby league was established in New Zealand as a player-led response to the NZRU's approach to player payments, and the initiative received significant support from across rugby's player base. When the tour's organisers requested expressions of interest from local rugby players, they received applications from around 160 of the 200 representative footballers of the day. And that included 18 of the original All Blacks. And those footballers selected for the tour were each required to contribute £50 to help cover expenses, with the understanding that all profits would be shared equally amongst the touring team when they got home. <coughs> 
In organising the tour, however, basketball and the other footballers involved face severe hostility from rugby's local governing bodies. When word of the plan first came to public attention, the tour's organisers were trespassed in sports fields under the authority of rugby's governing bodies, and the NZRU called on all top New Zealand rugby players to sign a document declaring their loyalty to rugby union. And when the identities of the, of the touring team became public in July 1907, the entire side, including four original blacks, was banned from rugby union for life. But despite this hostility, basketball's tour, which came to be known as Your Goals, was a resounding success. The All Golds claimed series victories against representative English and Australian Northern Union teams, and the tour provided a significant boost to the sport of rugby league. In England, the visit of an international touring side gave a sense of legitimacy to the new code, and in Australia, the All Golds time there provided a significant impetus to the growth of the new code um, in both Queensland and Australia and Sydney. I think maybe the first um, rugby league game in Queensland was an All Golds game. Mm -hmm. And as a financial proposition, the All Golds were solid too, <coughs> each of the players receiving £300 from the initial £50 investment when they got home. But despite this offshore success, the All Golds return to New Zealand was ultimately bittersweet and anticlimactic. Albert Basketball died of tuberculosis in Australia on 20 May 1908 just before the All Golds were to return home. This photo is of a match day program of the All Golds final test match against Australia. Um, and it has a picture of the late AX basketball at its centre. In light of his death, the first rugby league match played on local soil at Wellington's Athletic Park on 13th June 1908 was a benefit match for basketball's family. And while that game, and subsequent provincial fixtures helped to promote a flurry of interest in rugby league across New Zealand. By the following year, the game was struggling to make any headway outside of Auckland. And that struggle owed much to the hostility of rugby union administrators. When rugby league began to develop a presence in New Zealand in the early 20th century, rugby union's governing bodies were divided on how best to respond. At this time, the game was almost entirely administered by middle-class people, but those administrators were split into two broad camps. Speaking to this division in their general history of sport in New Zealand, Greg Ryan and Geoffrey Watson have described the divide in the following terms. Despite its cross-class appeal, New Zealand rugby developed in microcosm the class-based tensions of the British game. On the one hand, conservative, middle-class administrators determined to stay close to notions of rugby as leisure for amateurs. On the other, a more egalitarian element within colonial society. Upon rugby league's development in New Zealand, some of the more progressive administrators within New Zealand rugby called for changes to the rules of their game, including to the issue of player compensation, as the most effective means to respond or to counteract the interest being generated in rugby league. But amongst the game's middle class conservative elements, such amendments were simply untenable. Amongst this cohort, sport in general, and rugby in particular, were seen as important vehicles for the strengthening of ties between the colonial establishment here and the imperial establishment in England. And these administrators were keenly aware that any arbitrary rule changes to the issue of player payments within the New Zealand game would have seen the NZRU expelled by the RFU. When rugby league began to develop a presence in New Zealand, it was these conservative elements within the game that held sway over the NZRU. And so, rather than adapting the rules of their game to reflect the demands of a significant portion of the game's local player base, New Zealand rugby administrators responded to the arrival of rugby league by doing everything that they could to pull the game from the soil before it could take root. As already noted, the All Golds Tour was organised against a backdrop of hostility from the NZRU, 
And this campaign of antagonism, antagonism towards rugby league was maintained following the returns home, the team's return home in June 1908. Across the final months of that year, rugby league made some early strides as a national domestic sport, as members of the All Goals and other local footballers played provincial games all across the country. In response, the NZRU issued an additional 80 life bands to footballers from across the Taranaki, Wellington, South Canterbury, Otago, Southland, and Auckland representative teams. And alongside life bands, early league pioneers had to contend with the efforts of the NZRU to block their games from gaining access to sports fields. When rugby league developed a domestic presence in New Zealand from 1908, it did so on the basis of compensation, not payment. The local game developing provisions for the payment of 10 shillings a day for any footballer playing foot the game outside of his home district. This meant that across the early 20th century, the material difference between rugby union and rugby league in New Zealand was seven shillings. The NZRU providing its representative footballers with payment of three shillings a day while they were on tour while labelling as professional any footballer who received 10 shillings a day for playing rugby league. While this definition of professionalism was highly arbitrary, it reflected the RFU's rules on the matter, which specifically designated that any association with rugby league, irrespective of the presence or absence of player payment, was to be viewed as an act of professionalism. And with the professional moniker applied to rugby league in New Zealand, the NZRU and its influential allies in positions of authority use the label to justify their efforts to block rugby league from gaining access to football fields. And in this regard, they enjoyed success. Reflecting on the absence of club rugby league in Wellington in 1911, a Wellington rugby administrator attributed the situation to the actions of rugby's local governing bodies. Speaking to his counterparts in Sydney in July 1911, the manager of that year's New Zealand University's rugby team, J.L. Short, explained that rugby league had got a slight hold in Auckland, but as you know, New Zealand is a long, drawn-out country, and I think the interest is purely local. There is not a single club in Wellington, and there is not likely to be either. Rugby league will never get a hold there, because it cannot get a ground to play on. The rugby union has been very far seeing in this respect, but they have collared all the ground. In the face of this hostility from a powerful sporting organisation, Rugby League's domestic growth was largely confined to Auckland during the 1909 and 1910 seasons. The refledgling club scene and visits by international touring sides helped promote interest in the local game. So those are I don't know how clear those are, but that's, that's Victoria Park um, at the bottom, and that's the domain up there. Um, if you know Auckland, the domain's behind that hill, and Victoria Park Market is just there, behind these guys. Um, but from 1911, rugby league's geographic limitations were rapidly overcome. As the years just before World War I witnessed what John A. Lee later described as a big changeover from rugby to rugby league. In the Hawke's Bay, working class rugby clubs like Kiora and Awahuri switched to rugby league in 1911, leaving the Napier Old Boys Club as the only senior rugby side in town and turning the 1911 rugby season into what one journalist described as a fiasco. In the Lower Waikato, a club scene developed from 1911 and included clubs from Ngaru Wakia, Tokiri, as well as the Moihaka Māori side and a Huntley Brickworks Ramblers team. And this competition grew to such an extent that by 1912, Rugby League had largely replaced Rugby Union in that part of the Waikato. Despite the best efforts of Rugby's governing bodies, a club competition was established in Wellington in 1912, and here in Christchurch, the game developed a local presence in the same year. Speaking to the significance of Rugby League here in the early 20th century, in, the, in Christchurch in the early 20th century, the historian Libby Plumridge has identified the game as a marker of a distinct working class identity. 
Religious and sporting patterns were different for the working class, Tunbridge explained. Rugby was indeed played, but in the 1910s, rugby league drove at its expense. And in Auckland, rugby league's popularity grew in tandem with the sport's national growth. In 1912, 20 additional teams entered Auckland rugby league competitions, bringing the total to 33. And by 1914, there were as many rugby league teams in Auckland as there were rugby sides. The fact that this growth in rugby league's popularity was driven by working class people, that it occurred against the backdrop of a significant working class upheaval, and that by embracing rugby league, working people were openly defying the expectations of a sport that was closely connected to the political and economic establishment of early 20th century New Zealand, suggests that during the 1911 to 1913 period, Rugby League came to represent something more than simply a distraction from everyday life. During that historic moment, Rugby League emerged as a leisure pursuit that complemented the spirit of the times. As the division between the two rugby codes in New Zealand took on new life at a time when society was being sharply delineated along class lines. In making this assessment, it is not my intention to suggest that the broader social context was the only factor behind the game's sudden growth. There were, for example, sustained and dogged efforts being made by the Auckland Rugby League to expand the game beyond its boundaries. But the broader social context is significant because the 1911 to 1913 period promoted a sense of self-respect and self-esteem amongst working people that saw them increasingly unwilling to accept the blind dictates of people in authority and the broader class tensions that characterise this period in New Zealand history served to cast the issue of player payment in sport into sharp focus within footballing circles. As the game spread beyond Auckland from 1911, the issue of player compensation was consistently raised at meetings held to establish new competitions or clubs. And in arguing in favour of rugby league's approach to the issue, the game's administrators regularly presented their sports approach as one that offered a fair go to the working man. When the Tikwiri Huia Club was formed in April 1911, the president of the King Country League told interested members of the public that the only difference between Northern Union and rugby is that the champions of the former say it is a very unfair thing to ask men who are dependent upon some trade for their livelihood to leave their business and travel away without having their expenses paid. At a public meeting about rugby league held here in Christchurch in July 1912, the president of the NZRL, Duncan McLean, spoke of the key differences between rugby and league as the games were played in New Zealand. In this, in this address, McLean gave considerable time to the issue of player payment in the football codes and suggested that rugby league was out in the interest of the working man. This section of his address was covered by the press as follows. McLean now came into the great bogey professionalism when the NZRL applied for affiliation with the Northern Union, they said they wished to play the game, but did not wish to deal with the bylaws relating to professionalism. The Northern Union, recognising the different circumstances obtaining out here, acquiesced. A professional was a man who earned his living at the game, and there was no room for him in New Zealand. But the league said, if you were going to play the amateur game in the proper way, you will immediately bring about class distinction. But a working man on a six weeks tour should receive recompense, recompense for his loss of time, tens a day. McLean then challenged anyone to meet him on the pub public platform and state that any player was paid for his services in his own district. But he asked, why should the working man be debarred from playing football? The league was out in the interest of the working man. And at a meeting, held to establish the game in Wellington, around the same time, George Gillett of the Auckland Rugby League offered a similar assessment on the issue of player payment before asking his audience if they were going to allow the rugby union to coerce them into playing their game. The league game was far better for the player and for the public, declared Gillett. The rugby union preferred to shut the gates on a ground and leave it empty rather than let it to the league. This policy was due to an apprehension on the part of the union that if the league game were given a fierce and square chance, 
it would draw away some of their supporters. Will you allow the rugby union to dictate to you what class of football you will follow up? If the league game appeals to you, why should they coerce you in any way? And alongside these indirect connections between rugby league and the spirit of defiance and self-esteem that came to permeate working class life during the 1911 to 1913 period, the years just before World War I also saw the game develop a number of direct connections with the broader workers' movement. When Fred Evans and his fellow workers in Waihi took industrial action in 1912, members of the nearby Kangahaki League Club contributed three pounds to the FOL strike fund. Early NZRL meetings were occasionally held at, the Auckland tra at Auckland Trades Hall, while one of the game's earliest New Zealand heartlands, Freeman's Bay, was also a hotspot of the working class uprising. So these two photos are taken that intersection right here. That's the same community, I suppose. And that was a community of timber workers, wharfies, and seamen um, at the time. Now it's yuppie. <laughs> <laughs> In Wellington, the founding meeting of the game's provincial governing body was held in the city's trade hall. And it was organised in part by the Secretary of the General Labourers Union, MJ Reardon. Reardon subsequently served as president of the Wellington Rugby League across its inaugural years. And he was awarded the Wellington Rugby League's first life membership when he retired from the presidency in 1915. And here in Christchurch, Two of the city's foundation league clubs were established at meetings chaired by prominent members of the local workers' movement. In the case of Sydenham, is that how you say that? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> the club's founding meeting in early February 1912 was chaired by the president of the Canterbury Trades and Labour Council, Fred Burgoyne. And at Addington, the club's inaugural meeting on 31 January 1912 was chaired by the prominent local socialist, James McCullough. Reflecting on the difference between the rugby codes during this meeting, McCullough apparently expressed his confusion as to how one code paying three shillings a day was considered amateur, and another compensating its players 10 shillings a day was termed professional. So when rugby league established a national presence in New Zealand from 1911, the sport came to boast deep connections to working class life here. Ultimately, World War I severely undermined the breadth of that connection as the war undid much of the game's pre-war growth. As one of the country's first rugby league historians, Eric Bennett, explained in 1933, the Great War struck a severe blow to the growing power of rugby league in New Zealand as the game lacked the financial resources to meet essential calls of the young league to tide them over difficult times. As a result, by the end of the war in November 1918, the Auckland and Canterbury Rugby Leagues were the only provincial leagues left standing. However, while the war had a disastrous impact upon the breadth of the game's connection to New Zealand working class life, the depth of that connection remained very much intact. During the 1920s and 30s, rugby union began to consolidate its place as New Zealand's national sport as we currently understand it, but across the same period, rugby league continued to serve as a working men's alternative. As the sport became the dominant football code in numerous pockets of the country with a distinct working class character. Speaking to this connection in the local context, John Wilson suggested that some sports reinforced the working class character of Addington. In New Zealand, different sports have been played by members of different economic and social classes. Rugby league had working class roots in the north of England. That Addington and Sydenham were strongholds of rugby league was a mark of the working class character. It has been argued that rugby drew from all ranks of society and helped sustain the image of New Zealand as a classless society. The strength of league and weakness of rugby in working class Addington suggests that participation in sport sometimes reinforced rather than blurred class distinctions. And this assessment is evident right across New Zealand. 
During the interwar period, rugby league developed local heartlands across the country that ultimately remained at the forefront of the sport's local development for decades. And these heartlands were, without exception, parts of New Zealand where the main source of paid work was hard physical labour. In Auckland, the game remained closely associated with workers in the inner city, where Wolfies established their own club in 1920, and the City Rovers Club, based out of Freeman's Bay, dominated the local competition during the 20s. In Wellington, the Hutt Valley emerged as the capital's lead heartland, the area contributing four of the city's five senior teams in 1927, with players drawn primarily from the Woolen Mills Railway Works and the Gearneck Freezing Works. And the game also developed a strong working class character in rural New Zealand, where rugby league became synonymous with many of the country's coal mining settlements. Rugby league was rekindled in the Lower Waikato in 1919, with a senior competition made up of clubs from Taupiri, Huntley, Narawahia, and Hotu. And as the Waikato coal field expanded in the year, years following World War I, so too did the game's presence in the area, with newly established towns like Glen Massey and Puki Middle embracing the code. And on the West Coast, rugby league was established in 1919, after a brief start in 1915 that saw the game form and lapse within a matter of months. Following the war, the Kohenors, Blackpool and Runanga clubs laid firm foundations for the game. And across the interval period, league became ubiquitous in the Grey Valley. And while rugby league was always more of a social rather than a political expression in New Zealand working class life, the game retained many connections to those people and organisations who continued to fight for the dignity of labour in New Zealand across the interval years. Across the 1920s, the NZRL Delegates Conference occasionally met in the Wellington Trades Hall, while the Canterbury Rugby League Management Committee meetings were held at the Trades Hall here. Between 1927 and 1933, the chair of the Canterbury Rugby League was held by either Winter Cole or James K. Worrell. That's, that's James K. Worrell in the white shorts at the back. I'm playing for Addington. And Winter Cole and James K. Worrell were both trade unionists associated with the Addington Railway Workshops. And in Auckland, Ted Phelan was a well-known figure in both rugby league and trade union circles. Commenting on this dual association in 1925, the Truth newspaper suggested that while Phelan holds a portfolio in the trade union movement of secretaries for timber workers' unions, for everyone who knows him as a labourite, 20 associate his name with Carlo Park and the League Code. And similar connections existed right across the leadership of the industrial and political wings of the labour movement. The early development of the game on the West Coast enjoyed the support of Paddy Webb and Jack O'Brien, who were both heavily involved in the political upheaval of the pre-war period and subsequently served as cabinet ministers in the first Labour government. Another prominent figure in the pre-war working class upheaval, Patrick Hickey, was vice president of the Auckland Rugby League in the 1920s. Michael Joseph Savage was an official of the Auckland Rugby League in the 20s. Peter Fraser was vice president at Wellington Central Rugby League Club at the time. And according to John A. Lee, Walter Nash had a real appreciation of the fine points of rugby league, learning the code in England. And as alluded to throughout this talk, Lee was also a very keen rugby league man. In the 1920s, Lee served as an official of the Newton Rugby League Club, and as Labour member for Auckland East, he would arrange entertainment for visiting league teams at a time when the government refused to entertain them. From 1936 until 1941, Lee served as the president of the Auckland Rugby League, and in later years, he often interspersed his political writings with reflections on the game of rugby league in his newspaper, John Ailey's Weekly. And to finish this talk, I'd like to give the final word to Mr. Lee. And that's him. The great thing about Lee was he lost an arm in World War I, so he could 
pretty much say anything because nowhere could defy it, not I could um, challenge him as being unpatriotic because he had a floppy out. Um, he always had a floppy suit on. <coughs> I am a devotee of the rugby league heresy, Lee declared in 1948. Transfers apart, there is no professionalism in New Zealand league football. The out-of-pocket expenses enable a working man to tour, and that is all. And in 1946, Lee waxed lyrical about the game and its superiority over rugby. New Zealand wonders why league football is supreme in Auckland. It isn't that there are no good fellows playing rugby. There are plenty of good players and good sport from the other coast. But 13 men aside opened up the field, Lee gaps for the sharp, the swift, the thrustful, the brave, the virile. After all, the first quality is virility, constant pursuit of the ball, an opportunity, and the next courage. The ball swings this way and that, men are racing with the ball instead of mauling other men. On the wettest day, the play swings from touch to midfield, from midfield to touch, from goal line to goal line. There is less room for wrestling in the rucks, and yet the very additional speed caused by the absence of four men often makes tackling and running a greater hazard, and hence more injury unless there is greater fitness. Visitors to Auckland should go along to Carlo Park and see rugby league played and get to understand the reasons for the firmly rooted popularity of the game of tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you for your time and your attention this evening. Now, mission mahana kia koutou koutou. From, from the floor, so if anybody's got uh, any questions for him, please uh, show your hand. And we can... yeah. Um, yeah, were there were there also like uh, racial divisions between league and union? Um, In New Zealand, I mean. Yeah, it's sort of um, rugby rugby union didn't. Have a great presence within Māori um, until, like in the early 20th century, it was mostly Māori who attended schools that were modelled on, on the English public school tradition. That, um, like, so early early rugby league tourists, um, the early Māori rugby league tourists were almost all from that background, and they just switched um, over. Just the perceived unfairness, not less class, more just general antagonism towards the amateur ethos. Um, but later on, yeah, the, ra the racial issue really, rugby league really benefits from rugby union's discriminatory policies around the South African issue. And so when that starts to, I mean, the, the traditional narrative suggests that protest doesn't start till the 19, until um, overt protest doesn't start till the post war period. But my argument is that. There was protest immediately, and that was seeing the rugby league's ranks where Māori footballers were like, fuck that, and they'd take lead. So, yes, there are, but it sort of came later, because that was when there was a bigger presence of Māori footballers within the rugby game, whereas earlier on it was more, um, yeah, sort of these um, communities that were like Tiarawa, Ngati Karau, these. these Easy to have these really close connections with the crown. It's, it's, yeah, it's a different dynamic altogether. Yeah, they say about the dominance of rugby league in Auckland, and that's still, still the case today. It's, it's dominant, but there are sort of challenges put up to Auckland from time to time. I remember yes. the late 90s going to the final between Canberra and Auckland, it was the year before the Warriors started. Yes. So the Auckland team was a pack full of professional players from England and Australia. Canterbury team had one player that had played for New Zealand, I think it was Aaron Whitaker. Yeah. And um, Canterbury won by over 20 points. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Auckland doesn't always win. No. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the, the landscape of it is so different now. Yeah. It's, it's essentially a. I mean, because of the Winfield Cup and the nature of the Kiwis, it's very much an Australasian sort of game. It's the, the domestic competition. Um, struggles to feed that upper tier, I think, nowadays. Obviously, there's a disconnect between the, the grassroots and the top tier in, in New Zealand. Um, 
And so, yeah, that, that from that 90 view, there's just so much change. Yeah. And that's sort of coming, um, my argument is that starts in the late 70s when they start to say that outside offshore base players can play for the Kiwis. And that starts to erode the, the, the strength of the domestic game, really. I guess, um, what kind of fucked me on that as well, do you, would you be able to speak to the decline of rugby league in the mm. in particular? Because I think only recently the Browns can overtake the West Coast for having the second number, highest number Kiwis, yeah. and behind Auckland. Yeah. And the Wellington fans have had one since 1970, so the West Coast hasn't had one since 1969, mm. no, 1996, sorry. Sure. Thanks for my ears. Um, do you want to speak to that? Yes, I mean, simple answer is I think just the industrialisation, um, the game, that's, that was the heart of the game in New Zealand domestically, where the blue collar industrial community, work, freezing workers, miners, um, the timber workers around Pukaroa, um, the, the mines, and so, I mean, that, that the, West Coast, the West Coast was dropping off for a long time. Um, across the post-war period as the demand for coal decreased and I think the neoliberal era um, sort of cemented that decline and that can be seen all over the show. Huntley just absolutely bottomed out as a result of the, um, the reduction of the workforce there and the game of Pukaroa bottomed out and Otahu had these freezing works and they were all gone um, very quickly so yeah, the industrial, the loss of the industrial working class as a significant body in New Zealand impacted the domestic game. But interestingly, a lot of them moved to Australia and they just play it there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's sort of like the the Quinn, the um, Kalen Ponger type situation now where you've got these, these young Māori Australians is very much a response to that um, outmobilisation <coughs> as a result of neoliberalism, I think, just moving to places where there was still industry, where there are still these jobs. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, I think um, that's written all over this, the game's history is, um, is the impact of industrial decline. And like you say, the West Coast has um, just produced an incredible amount of Kiwis in those middle decades of the 20th century. Um, but from what I've read, the, the coal industry was in decline quite severely by the 60s, and it's just petered out from there. Their, their presence. Oh, just on the um, west coast, um, it's, it, again, I'm not, I'm not even pretending it's a question, it's just a statement. Um, the, um, after the Pike River mine disaster in like, late 2010, the Warriors organised their pre-season game against the Newcastle Knights because they come from a coal region, and so the week before the February earthquake, the Newcastle Knights played the Warriors in Grey now. Yeah. And it's like, how does, I mean, it's amazing because it could completely got forgotten because mm -hmm. of the earthquake yeah. that happened afterwards. But yeah. that's pretty spectacular that the, both the Knights and the Warriors, you know, foregoing as much money as they could have done yeah. to go and, I think they got 6,000 people or something, which was a big deal for, yeah. for Grey Mount. But they were both putting their, like, uh, working class and coal region heritage. You know, the Warriors obviously aren't from the West Coast, but they, they went down there as a tribute to the. Mm -hmm. uh, that was cool. Yeah. 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 No, I hadn't heard about it until I um, was researching this, and perhaps the same thing just got overflowed by other media concerns. But yeah, that was real neat to see that, and cool to see winning small um, and all the local punters. It'd be cool if Warriors could do that more. Get out to the like. I often think, why don't they, why don't they go to Huntley? Why don't they go to Davies Park? There's a heartland right there. But yeah, the game is is a business now. Yeah. Here's another William Park question actually. Um, I was obviously earlier in the year with a um, kids team and I noticed on the wall a um, photo of a poster for an exhibition match. Um, I think it might have been in the 20s or 30s and it was American football team that was visiting oh, yes. and, and playing um, the league team. Yes. Was, were there any connections, what were the connections with America at the time? Was that, um, was that because the rugby union in New Zealand didn't wish to play American um, the American rules at the time, or did they, or, or, and did they decide then to um, hook up with rugby league as a more sympathetic 
transition to the natural, do you want anything more about that? Oh, I know a little bit. That was the all sad tour, yes. what they called them. I was surprised to see the posts and everything still there. Yeah. The you know, some, an, Eng an English fellow um, did some research on them. I think it was, um, it might have been contacts made with some of the soldiers when they were over oh. here. And then it was like a, like a sports promoter over there who um, saw a business opportunity. And it was in, initially successful, like with crowds in Australia, but I think it sort of bottomed out after a while when, I mean, they had to have lots of like New Zealand players play in their team because of injury or just lack of stamina, I guess, for that length of tour. So, um, yeah, and I, I, um, I don't know if there was any political, like if there was yeah, any sort of rugby machinations causing any problems there, but um, that is an interesting tour, but I don't think it ca anything else came of it really in terms of it was just that one off. I think there's a little bit of domestic rugby league in, in America, but nothing, yeah, nothing of massive significance. Yeah, we've got there's a good book about that tour by a guy called Gavin Rudderson, called No Helmets or something. Uh, he should give you loads of detail. Yeah, and there's, there's, there's two regional conferences in America at the moment. Uh, yeah, one based around Boston and one in Florida. Uh, I'll this more in Chicago. Hi. Hi, um, I'm actually related to Ron Acklin. Oh, so yes. I've got a bit of background on some stuff. Um, Player compensation was always a real problem with tours, and I know that in the 60s and 70s there were a lot of um, player revolts um, around that, and it players were away from their families for a very long time, right? Yeah. How far did your research go? We're going to talk about that early. Yeah. Did you, did you also look at, at those 40, 50, 60, 70 kind of bracket and the issue about player compensation? Mm. Um, you mentioned it in the earlier part, yeah. actually, and I'm pretty sure it's still pretty much an issue. Yes. Yeah, the book does go right up to um, 2000 in the historical sense, and I'll just do a conclusion to talk about the game now and compare it, like, just like look at the themes that run through the game's history. Um, yeah, it's a tricky one, the player payment issue, because rugby league people have had so much shit put on them about it that they're a bit cagey about talking to me about it sometimes. Um, but the thing, I mean, the first evidence of player payment that I've seen in New Zealand was in the 1950s. But like you say, the tourists, the touring sides got um, got a compensation payment and it could go and be increased based on how many kids they had and whether they had a wife. Um, but it was always, it was always set to address that person, like to cover that person's wage, it wasn't a, a livelihood thing. Um, so, um, and also there's not, there, it's not really uniform because um, in Auckland was paying mm -hmm. players a lot earlier than anyone else and then it sort of came, it was club specific too, it depends what club there was, but all the clubs had their own cultures and their own ways of doing things and um, so I don't, it wasn't it wasn't commonplace in the New Zealand game until the eighties. Like that was when everybody was play, paying their players something, um, as far as I can tell. Um, so you're referring to the club level. The club level. Um, as terms of like um, the the rate of payment for the Kiwi started to increase in the seventies and eighties when the game here started to have more contact with Australia and they were trying to catch up pretty much because they just couldn't compete with the Australians anymore. The the local game. Um, I mean, they, they didn't beat the, the Australians between, I think, 71 and 83, and that was when they made the decision that actually we will have offshore place based players play for the Kiwis, whereas up to that point, that was one of the Sorensons they let in, and that changed the game, really, because then all the players essentially wanted to get offshore to make some coin, and then the NZRL actually encouraged that movement as a development process, but that that hollowed out the game locally and really opened the door for what we have now which is a rugby league a national representative team based in australia and some of whom don't have any real connection here except heritage and um and that was well I mean, that's just the nature of a game based around um 
like the money just skews things. Auckland all, always skewed the New Zealand game, the Sydney game skewed the Brisbane game, and the Australian game skewed the New Zealand game because, um, I mean, it's I guess some of these guys could make a livelihood out of a talent and um, don't begrudge the fella for going and making a bit of um, coin for his um, for the skill he has. But at the end of the day, the the local game has suffered as a result, um, and that's yeah really come from that era I think and how you address that I don't know because the NRL is wagging the um, is um, the tail that wags the dog now and um, they don't seem to have too much concern about the grassroots game here so uh, hi um, is there any indication that the class of boys is just that then is still a big part of rugby league like in grassroots or yeah. Well, people don't even talk about class anymore. It's sort of a poor little word. Yeah. Um, if you're a social society, we do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so I don't know. Class has been so racialized in this country that um, that that almost the fact that it's a Māori and Pacifica game almost says that in code um, because of the nature of um, New Zealand society. I think. That's not to say that all Māori and Pacifica people are, are working class, but I mean, that's the nature, that's how the society is structured, I think. So, um, I think it's still there. I think it's still a West Auckland and a South Auckland game where, I, where I'm from. And, um, but the games, both games sort of serve the same thing now. They're sort of, um, the professional sport just lets you get out of the ghetto. Um, and that's, they're sort of the same. They're both the same thing. It's, they sort of both draw on the same player base. I think um, people who see that as an opportunity to escape a challenging situation. So they sort of both become hoop dreams. But I think at the at the grassroots, there's still definitely a working class connection. Um, but it, yeah. Apart from class, have you looked at religion? Yeah, religion's a, a, a big thing in some parts of the South Island with the Irish Catholics mm. in Dunedin and here on the West Coast. Um, but it didn't have a, it wasn't a main, like in Australia, it seems like all the Irish Catholics were rugby league people, whereas here, they didn't, it didn't have that. There was a moment when there was heaps of sectarianism in general society and some of that went into the rugby union and the, and the Irish Catholic communities left, essentially, a, a few different um, a few different clubs switched over and there was a threat of a mass movement but the rugby union managed to calm that down um, and there's there's a very prominent um, what is it, Seven Day Adventist I can't remember, one of the yeah, American Christian yeah, because they go to church on Saturday to leave the playoffs, don't they? Sure. They can play rugby yeah one of the very prominent Māori figures, Steve Watney, um, he was uh, maybe a Latter-day Saint. There's that, there's that connection, but um, yeah, that's the main one, the Irish Catholics, um, down these ways. I, I just wanted to draw to that point because um, around the turn of the century, Sydney and Addington were the primarily Catholic parts of oh, the yeah. church. Yeah. Sure. From my understanding, anyway. Yes. Yeah. Uh, like a very Anglican city. Yeah, sure. Mm. That's an interesting point too. Hi. I'm sorry, hey. Uh, there's also class dimensions to like, it's not that those parts of the city were, it's like there was discrimination like on a sectarian basis. Oh, Is that, that's a separate, that's a separate yeah. discussion. Yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, don't. <laughs> no, just the old uh, stuff there. Yeah. <laughs> um, I. Thank you so much. I don't know anything about rugby league, and so I like really appreciated <laughs> uh, oh, this cool. talk. Thank you. But I was wondering if someone could tell me if this is like related to what Martin spoke about in his introduction, uh, the ongoing sort of like coercion of um, like union and stuff. Like, what is happening with like rugby league park, like post earthquake? Is that like now a place that where rugby union is played? Um, and has that has been something that was co-opted by like? <laughs> Right. Can someone explain that to me? Like, is that is that part of the class, like, kind of stuff? And the, the, has it still got its geographical name? Really? Well, no. Like, what is league still even really yeah, no, geographical name is 
right? Yeah. yeah. But yeah. they moved the league, the, all the league gets played out at Nathuna Wide, which is further west, the new sports ground. But the Victory Park board, which ran Lancaster Park, yeah. and, um, as you were talking about, banned rugby league from the 20s, maybe? So there wasn't a game of rugby league played until I think the 80s, maybe, at Lancaster Park, which by that time, then it was called AMI Stadium, then it fell over, and then they didn't have a stadium, and then AMI collapsed. So they took <laughs> Rugby League Park, put the Crusaders there, and renamed it AMI Stadium again. Yeah. Yeah. And, and moved Rugby League Park off and just said, Rugby League doesn't happen oh, yeah. anymore. It doesn't happen in Christchurch. Yeah. And that, I mean, that just speaks to the power of Rugby Union here. Like, um, yeah, you're rugby right. League. <laughs> I remember bringing to the Lloyds and Lloyds and Rome at um, Auckland being like, it would be so suicide to not know who won the All Black Test and go work on Monday. Um, and that's just the nature of it. Like, I mean, it's the old school, it's the old boys' network, mm. and that's their game. And I don't think there's anything sinister about it, it's just how, how it works. They get together and they <laughs> chat about what, they, what their do. interests are, and they, um, yeah, they have incredible social influence. Done, and so, man. Um, and rugby league people, rugby league doesn't doesn't have access no. to the same power, um, mm. social power, and so they yeah. they get marginalised and sidelined. And um, yeah, it's not really taken seriously either. Even though it's gone on for decades and decades, it's just um, yeah, it goes on. Uh, yeah, it wasn't a question, a useful question for you. Sorry, but that was amazing. No, Thank you. <laughs> Can I um, ask about going a bit further back, like, because in Australia, league is huge, and it's a convict country. New Zealand was more of a settler country. The people were coming from much wealthier backgrounds. Is there any correlation there? Like, were the people far more working class in Australia and therefore stuck to league, like glue mm. more, rather than here where, you know, the people were different? I'm not sure what explains that in Australia, how that got the upper hand over there. Um, I mean, there was definitely there was definitely demands for rugby league here. It was the rugby unionists that um, put skids to a lot of that. Um, so, what the difference was, I don't know. I don't think, and I think they were quite similar. Like, there was a lot of movement between the two countries. I mean, a lot of the um, say the first Labour government was almost all Australian, right? Like there was, there was a lot, a lot of cross pollination mm. at that time. That was just an Australian phrasing. Mm. Uh, Fraser wasn't it? Um, what else was Australian? Fraser was Scottish. Yeah, but there was a bunch of them that were Australian. Yeah. Harry Holland. Um, so there was a lot of movement between them. They were, I mean, the concept of New Zealand was quite new. I think like um, these were just two in, imperial outposts for a lot of people, and they moved quite freely between them. You see the movement of the miners, and you can see it was in that revolutionary moment. There was so much cross pollination all around the Pacific um, Rim. So, um, no, I think just different conditions locally, depending on how the people and you know, what the game meant to people in authority, and how, how widely popular it was when the rugby league became a challenge to its pro prominence. Mm. I think there's an element of truth to everything what you said. I think that the, 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 the settler population, however you want to describe, were different. And that Australia didn't have quite the same level of attachment to the empire that New Zealand does. So, for example, in the First World War, Australia voted down conscription, whereas New Zealand obviously didn't have a referendum; it was just automatic, you know, we didn't support the empire. So, I think there were there was a difference clearly, and I don't think they had the same network of public or private schools, which I think was what you in Australia on the outset. That, that whereas here they just transplanted it basically. Mm. So, mm. you know, they had a network of private schools almost as soon as people started arriving here. So, I think mm. there's a truth in what you said. Just on the school thing, and it's not so much a question to Ryan, but probably some of the other people here, the local people. Um, I haven't had any teaching to leave 
Wilson told me somewhere that an hour earlier and I decided to eat during rugby season. And mm-hmm. I went to Shirley and it was like a league team and a rugby team in the middle of my country and shit. So that didn't really matter. Um, there was no chance <laughs> that I don't think that but there was a big competition between Christchurch Boys High School and Christ. There was the big annual one being a state school, one being a private school, and that was a rugby game. And then there was, you know, Limwood and Aaron and all the schools they participate in the league. And then suddenly the physical professional day, I think Limwood set up a cadet thing to train students and they become professional football players and either toes. And there was a, it was read into the paper about how these you know, 18 year olds come on who actually should have left school but they were being kept behind because they just and they were actually mm-hmm. too old and too big and there was all this, you know, letters to each paper from, you know, concerned mothers of Christ. It was it was a real obvious explosion of the of the the cultural and class character of the two games in terms of the consciousness of, you know, the Christchurch middle class. Which was really interesting, it made quite an impact for someone that I didn't pay any attention to rugby either because my, my way of thinking was just being on a similar sort of focus and so Stuart just holding a lot of interest in rugby as a game and make the people over up with you put it out of town. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and then there was this whole crisis of rugby and professionalism and the, and the competition of the league and suddenly this was something that was talked about all the time. Um, and I was yeah. wondering whether that, um, whether that, you know, what happened to that, whether that's still the case that, um, you know, the Eastern side schools are still predominantly leads. I used to live just around the corner from Linwood Park, so I know there's still a pretty good turnout for them to see. Massive. Um, but that's about the only connection I have with um, you know, how, how much interest there is in, in the two things as sort of geographic and class differences between the two sports these days. Mm-hmm. So I just wondered if anybody who's involved with the game needs to comment on that. Has it, has it kind of all got mixed up and, and um, or is it still Just ask you just related to this, like the orphan school situation, because I, I understood that basically rugby league is still kept out of most of these so-called prestigious yeah. rugby schools, and they, you know, have these big scholarships where they, you know, approach players of promise, especially a lot of the Pacific Islanders. Um, I, I sort of uh, know of one case where someone Thank you. I, I knew, Thanks, um, many years ago has a, yeah. and we were talking about this about 10 years ago, um, this woman who's a friend of my sister, and we went to the school of Wanganui, and she, her grandson was offered a $70,000 scholarship to St. Kennedy's College, which is like the number one rugby school. But from what I understand, a lot of these 
competition kids can't play rugby league you know, they, they've grown up playing in, in clubs at finding level but they've literally forced them to the rugby union um, competition and it's only later that they can go back to rugby league is, is that actually the case or what well, that's the impression that i get like like you yeah. say schools don't there's have a very league few rugby league, league schools that you hear of them yeah and a lot of them Auckland. a lot of them will sort of over overlap those traditional working class areas too they're not the they're not those high high detail um prestigious schools so yeah that's certainly the impression that i get that there's um still a lot of resistance towards the game within those schools they talk about they, they just frame them in different terms now it's the heritage it's we can't we can't handle that we don't have enough room for that in the pro sport right around but i mean um yeah, that's that certainly seems to be what's going on. Um, but they still actively block them mm. in the resources yeah, given to the coaches and yeah. the press. Yet the young players at St. Paul's and De La Salle are being coached by the NRL selectors who are coming over to watch their game. It's happening now. Mm. But it's been happening since the 90s, since the NRL selectors started coming to Auckland. There was band at the school that I went to, I went to school with Monty Beeson. He wasn't allowed to play rugby or he, he either played club league or nothing at all. He wanted to play both rugby and league. He was good at it. And it's been going on for years. So here, uh, what they do? Our son, or I should say Andrew, the pro, they don't Or, um, no, because it's tradition. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, let's see. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's <laughs> odd. <laughs> it's just <laughs> odd. <laughs> They encourage okay. it more. Um, <laughs> any more questions of a sort of open nature? If not, I'm going to suggest that we just break up and informally anybody who wants to have a chat to Ryan or got any specific questions or just a general chat with everybody about rugby league. Uh, that would be fantastic. So I'd just like to say thank you to Ryan for a really interesting and informative talk and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, please don't hold that off. Let's keep talking league. <laughs> okay, thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you.